I just could not bring myself today to open up the Bible and to preach from where we left off in Mark last time. Because a couple of days before Christmas, I just didn't want to talk about if your right eye causes you to offend, gorge it out. You know, it's better to go into life with one eye than into hell with both eyes. You know, I just couldn't, I just couldn't bring myself to preaching that sermon today. So I am going to do a very anti-Jeff sermon today, and we'll see where it goes. Um, the title of today's sermon is God Knows Best. I did not make bulletins, so it ain't there. Uh, God Knows Best. And we're going to look at a couple of Proverbs, and then we're going to jump into the Gospel of Matthew. The theme of today's message is that God knows what is best for us. So, Father, as I begin to share this message this morning, I pray that you would bring forth that which people in this room right now, that with those on the internet or TV, the, that which they need to hear, that we all need to hear, that we all need to walk away from here this morning with. I pray, Father, that your perfect will would be done this morning as as this message comes forth, and that it would glorify your name. That's our desire, Lord, in this place, that your name would be glorified. So in the name of Jesus, we pray. I mean, some people probably came today, being it's the Sunday before Christmas, they probably came today expecting to hear a sermon on a little baby laying in a manger, surrounded by animals. Anybody that knows me knows I'm not an animal person. So the thought of Jesus being born in a dirty manger surrounded by smelly critters is not something that appeals to me at the holidays. So you're not going to get one of those cutesy little messages this morning. For the most part, I'm going to be talking about something totally, I mean, quite different this morning. And what led me to just kind of give this message and such is in scripture pastors, elders you know uh, were commended to be examples to those in the church to be examples to the congregation well the only way we can be examples is sometimes talk about things that we have gone through or you guys have to witness things so today with that in mind I just want to be kind of candid and share with you a few things that Marilyn and I have gone through recently. Some, some people understand this. They know a little bit of what we've been going through. But I want to share with you just kind of what has happened, not only in the situation, but in our mind, in my mind, through the reading of Scripture and such over the past month. And especially over the past week, because the past week has been kind of, you know, one of those weeks here. It's been a very difficult week. The last 10 days have been very difficult for Marilyn and I. Um, most people in here know that back in October, which seems like forever ago, we purchased a condo right down the street here. And we were supposed to close on that condo. It was supposed to be all done and everything December the 2nd or December the 3rd. And we were supposed to get the little keys and, and go in there and ha live happily ever after. Um, two weeks ago, the last time we met for service, we were still in limbo because it hadn't closed yet. We were still in limbo. Now, if we had had church last week, this is what you would have heard me say when I came in sometime. That, oh, the day before, last Saturday, so a week from yesterday, we backed out of the deal. We had to just back out of the whole thing. We had to say, done, enough is enough. So last Sunday at this time, Marilyn and I were actually in quite a bit of shock um, because we were really being forced to back out of the home. And I was feeling like a real jerk last week, a real fool, I guess, maybe not jerk is the right word, but a fool, 
because we had already foolishly purchased all kinds of beautiful cabinets for the kitchen on that place and flooring and and even when the flooring guy when I went in there to buy the flooring on a home we didn't close on yet he says you don't want to buy anything for a home before you close I said it's okay Joseph it'll be all right so I convinced Marilyn last time she listens to me that all would be well and we laid down a whole bunch of cash not counting the deposit on the condo blah 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 the long and the short of it all is you know a week ago we realized that we had been misled intentionally or not we do not know but we had been misled and deceived by the property owner the the homeowners association for the condo development and the realtors selling us the property so we had to just forcefully we had to back out of the deal um, and it was really disappointing to us. I mean, we were crushed by this whole thing and very disappointed because we've always said, well, God wouldn't let us buy kitchens and flooring and everything. He would protect us from that if we weren't going to get the place. That's not the case, folks. You know, uh, he lets us do some things at times that are kind of stupid. And, and, and it was really disappointing. And we had ex invested a lot of time and time and money in deposits and appraisals and applications fee and inspections and all this cabinets and flooring. I do thank God, one thing Marilyn and I praise God for, every time we went out, like on Black Friday and everything, to buy all the new appliances we needed and the new couch, we just couldn't agree on anything because I am so thankful for that or we'd be having the best of garage sales today at the church, you know, a penny on the pound or something, trying to figure out all this. So, you know, we praise God. So far, I haven't described anything that's a good example for you guys to follow. I mean, I, I'll give you a secret. Your pastor messes up at times. He's not perfect. You probably didn't even suspect that. But what I really want to talk about today is that through all of that, and especially looking back now, a week later upon that, um, I can really see the relevance of Scripture in a situation like this and the importance of heeding Scripture. The day that we backed out, a week ago yesterday, the day that we backed out, with all this tension and everything in my body, I went to my Bible and I picked it up and I turned to the next proverb that I had been reading in and I read in Proverbs 20, 24, this verse, Man's steps are ordained by the Lord. How then can man understand his way? You know, a man's steps are ordained by the Lord. How then can man understand his way? So I was sitting there in the midst of really feeling like a fool, sitting in my library at home in shock and disappointment, and my eyes fell upon that verse, and all it was basically saying is, you know what, God controls every one of your steps. God controls every one of your steps. And, and I may not always understand, we may not always understand why we take those steps in the way that we go, the way that he is pushing us. We just don't understand it. I mean, after backing out on that condo purchase, after doing that stupid pre-close shopping I had done, sitting there in my disappointment, I found all kinds of comfort in this one verse, that my steps are ordained, they are controlled, dictated, directed by God. I mean, I just found so much comfort in that. And to me, that, that just demonstrates the importance of Scripture in our life, the relevance of Scripture in every one of our situations. The Bible is full of truth that we can, we can lean, and lean upon and grow from. I mean, what this verse was telling me a week ago was that God was still in control. No matter all the stuff I had done, He was still in control of the situation. He had led us to buy the condo we had, and he had watched me buy all these cabinets and flooring that we would never install in a place that we were in the place that we were moving into. I mean, and he ordained all of that, Scripture tells me, from heaven. And I may not understand it, but I'll tell you what, 
sitting there reading that verse, the Spirit of God just comforted me in the fact that God is sovereign. The sovereignty of God is a very comfortable feeling at times. That even when things seem chaotic to us, He's got it all under control. Now, I read that verse, and I knew that it had all happened for a reason at that point. It was a reason unknown to me and a reason I may never know. I may never fully understand. And you know what? At that moment, I was okay with that because I was finding comfort in Scripture, knowing God was sovereign, knowing He was directing my steps. You know, what is it? Marilyn and I talked. Maybe God's trying to teach Marilyn and I something. Maybe God was using Marilyn and I as willing participants to teach the homeowner, the, the seller something, or the homeowners association, or the insurance company, or someone else all along the way. Maybe God was using the situation in that way. We don't know. But what we do know is he was directing, he was ordaining our steps. Why all that happened is no longer important to me. Because I'm reminded now and I remember that God is in control. I don't need to worry about all the details when he's in control. That, that morning I picked up a commentary because I like to do that on that little verse. And the common, commentator just basically said this. He says in there, we, will always, we won't always know what is good for us, but God who controls the future knows. So I sat there reading that and I thought, you know what? God knows it was good for us to back out of this and put all this effort in. You know, I don't understand why, but he knew it was good for us. So I sat down my Bible that Saturday morning, fully confident that God was still in control, and I was sure glad he was. I mean, within a day or two, Marilyn and I were joking that the church was going to get some beautiful new carpet and hickory flooring out front and, and all of this, and new cabinets in our kitchen area, you know. We, you know, as long as everybody likes brie, uh, that's the color of the cabinets, but... Uh, in fact, they're out back. Um, so we start joking about it by the time the Christmas party came. We were just kind of, you know, feeling a bit more relaxed at our stupidness. Um, but I'll tell you what, we're not going to get carpet in this church now. We're not going to get new cabinets and we're not going to get hickory flooring. Because something kind of cool happened in the last week. Um... Yesterday, we purchased a different condo. And this one should have no issues because of the development and all this other stuff. And if it does have issues, I tell you right now, we're moving to Tahiti. <laughs> you know, the first condo, we did it. I mean, we just looked at it and we kept telling ourselves, Marilyn and I told ourselves all the time, you know, with enough money and enough time, we can make this condo work. But we knew we'd never be happy with it because we couldn't even put our couch in it. We couldn't even put our living room set in that old condo. On Friday, we, as soon as we saw this condo that we purchased yesterday on Friday, we walked out of there and we just looked at each other and says, this works and we do not have to do a single thing to it. And we just started, I mean, crying there with the realtor kind of thing. But we were a long way from everything. So immediately we just looked at our realtor and we said, please cancel the other five showings you had lined up today. We're going to put an offer in on this first one that you showed us. And after that offer was placed and before it was accepted by the seller yesterday, we came home and I sat down and I picked up the Bible and I read the next proverb, Proverb 24, that I was at. I want you to turn with me to Proverbs 24. And as you're turning, I just want to talk about the Proverbs a little. You always hear me say, context, context, context. Well, you know what? The Proverbs are the one book we can take a little bit out of context. Because Proverbs are, in themselves, short, pithy sayings that convey kind of a general truth or advice. At the beginning of the book of Proverbs, the writer of those Proverbs, King Solomon, he, kind of, he says this at the beginning of the, 
for the book of Proverbs. He tells us that the reason he wrote down these Proverbs is so that the reader would know wisdom and instruction, that they would know how to discern the sayings of understanding, that they would receive instruction in wise behavior, so on and so forth. So the Proverbs themselves lend themselves actually fairly well to a little of cherry picking. All right, most of scripture doesn't, but the Proverbs are just that. Proverbs 24 is a bunch of little pithy sayings that have relevant truths that we can apply to our lives. So, in reading Proverbs 24 that day, and I'm going to just pick out this morning and just show you the train of thought that I came across that was very relevant to what we were going through. The first thing was, was verse 16. When I got to verse 16, it says, For a righteous man falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in the time of calamity. You know, after that first condo fell through and we kind of fell with it, I could have just laid there, licked my wounds a bit, sung poor, poor, pitiful me, let our whole world remain torn asunder, be filled with all kinds of garbage feelings. But instead, I remembered from the week before that God ordained my steps. And I found comfort in that. So what would we do? We would get up. We would get up. The one thing that that first ordeal had convinced us of is that we should stop paying rent. You know, So we said, we're going to look at something else. So last Sunday was a snow day from church. So we sat down about noon and by 5 o'clock in the evening at the internet while it was snowing outside, we had a list of like 20 homes that we were going to go look at that would all work for us. But in Proverbs 24, there's another important truth. And since cherry picking is okay, I'm, I pick that truth. It's found in verse 6. By wise guidance you will wage war, and in abundance of counselors there is victory. So, that's important. Anybody ever bought a home? It can be a battle at times. <laughs> so I thought, okay, we're waging war here. What do we need? We need some wise counselors. You know, the first condo, we had no counselors. We just saw an ad, went to the seller's agent, and said, here, we'll pay... Full price. Give it to us. Wasn't a lot of counselors. So we learned from our mistake. So this time we called um, the woman who had sold our house in Manchester five years and we go and we said, okay, be our agent. Help us. We contacted the bank who needed to lend us money and we said, be our help. Help us. We are looking for wise counsel. So we sent our list of 20 homes to each of them and they did their magic thing and within minutes I start getting emails from them saying don't buy that one, take that one off the list, there are a lot of problems with that one, that one's a short sale, that one's bank owned, one of the emails just said run. <laughs> Just said, run. <laughs> but isn't that what wise counselors are supposed to do? Is they are supposed to sh give us a bit of information that we don't know from just looking at a cursory, you know, look at an internet ad. They've done some research. They know the developments. They do all that, you know, and run. Um, <laughs> so the wise counselors were giving us feedback and we were taking it. And we were pulling properties off the list as fast as we were told to do so. Now one thing on this that I had to deal with too, and Marilyn did, is since we had been kind of deceived and everything on the old property, we had a lot of tension inside. I don't know if you've ever had that tension when maybe you know you've been misled and you've invested a lot because of it and you just start like, oh, I hope they get their due. Right, And especially since we learned that this whole thing basically fell apart because the other seller, whatever, but she had 
dug a hole for herself in this whole thing. So, but then look at verses 17 and 18. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. And do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. For the Lord will see it and be displeased. And turn his anger away from your enemy. And the implication is towards you. <laughs> so I knew I could not as a Christian hold on to anything and I know from other places in scripture that I have to walk in a manner worthy of my calling especially when we got a church looking at us and how we're going to behave through this you know I mean you guys would think totally different if, if like last Sunday this all happened the day before and I bring in a bunch of pitchforks and I say alright let's go rally <laughs> let's go down the street you know with fire and pitchforks let's take this into our own hands but that's not how Christ works. We're not to gloat when an enemy falls or, or when somebody stumbles, no matter how unrighteous they are. We're, we're not to gloat. Do not rejoice. You know, when we go through ordeals as emotionally driven as we did, backing out on the purchase of a home, often we just want a gun for bear to blame somebody other than ourselves to dwell upon that enemy with our thoughts our emotions can get the best of us at times but you know what God wishes good on every man he gives good things to every man water, food, protection, life he desires, it says in Scripture, that every person come to repentance. That every person finds life in Christ. He desires that. That should be my attitude too towards those that have misled me and hurt me. I mean, the Bible tells me to pray for my enemies and those who mistreat me wrongfully. That all goes back to that whole thing of God ordaining steps, trusting in His sovereignty. If I trust in His sovereignty, then I can go through life without holding on to all that garbage. Okay, that's, that's the story. Now we jump ahead to Friday. Okay, Friday. Remember, we had five or six, I guess it was six homes lined up, 10 o'clock, man, boom, 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 boom. Our realtor is this little pit bull regiment sort of type person. It's great. She's wonderful. Lines them all up. We get to the first one, we say, okay, we're buying it. We get, okay, she says, okay. We go up to Bedford to her office. We're sitting down there. We're writing out the offer and she's typing away and then she looks across the table at Marilyn and I and she says, okay. The home is listed at this amount. How much do you want to make an offer of? Marilyn and I looked at each other. We looked at her and we says, give her a hundred more than she's asking. But we would like the fridge if we can get it thrown in. The realtor in shock looked at me and said, No! No! You're not going to offer her more than she's asking? I said, Well, what do you recommend? She says, Well, let's do this. Let's ask for 5000 less than she's asking. And let's also ask for $5,000 in closing fees. And then let's ask for the fridge. <laughs> and as she said that, terror went through my body and fear. I mean, we wanted this place. We didn't want it. Let's just, let's just we'll pay whatever they want. And the realtor looks at us and she says, you know what, because she tried, I mean, she has worked with us five years ago when we were moving to Nashua and never did buy. And she says, you know, you two are too trusting and too nice. She said, I want to protect your interests a little. All Marilyn and I want to do is just to do whatever, you know, but the realtor, she walks out and to go get some paperwork and Marilyn and I look at each other and we say you know we're both afraid of losing this thing and we're talking but we said well isn't that what wise counsel is supposed to be about I mean when you get the wise counselors shouldn't you just listen to them 
even if you have to step past your fears. I mean, isn't that what Scripture, you know, we're, we have to step past our fears often to do what the Bible tells us, to do what wise counselors tell us, to do what we know is right. It, it, it's afraid. It's a fearful thing at times. We have to step past. And then that, that verse kept coming to mind. By wise guidance we are to wage war and in the abundance of counselors there is victory. And Marilyn and I knew we just didn't want to make a, a bad mistake and lose this but we had to trust God. We had to trust the wise counsel he had sent us. Well, when it was all done and said after the offer, then there was a counter offer, and then there was a counter offer to the counter offer. And in the end, listening to the wise counsel before us, our realtor saved us the same amount of money that we lost on the other house. And we got the fridge. And, and the cool thing, the kicker of this whole thing is, all of those cabinets we bought for the other house, in the new place, there's only one room that needs any work, and that's the laundry room, and it needs a bunch of cabinets. So God is good. And that's, you know what? When, you know, our, our realtor yesterday just sent this little email and said, congratulations. And Marilyn was in the office and we read it and we both just started crying at the mercies of God. And all that Marilyn could just say through her tears is, praise Jesus, thank you, Lord, praise Jesus. And that's all I, all I felt. You know, and... Proverbs 24, it says, verse 3, By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established, and by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. That, that just gave me assurance again. God's wisdom was doing this. God's wisdom. I mean, we may never understand His ways, folks, but what we can trust in is that He is doing exactly what is good for us. I mean, this week we are celebrating Christmas. We will remember the birth of a baby, of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Talk about a non-understandable way of doing things. The way that God worked in Christmas. The Jews were waiting for their promised Messiah. And they expected him to come in a chariot with a sword in hand, with an army in tow, to overthrow the Roman Empire and to give them everything that they were worth. That's what they were expecting. But God, this one whom we often cannot understand or comprehend his wisdom, he, knowing the very best thing that he could do, did not send them a Messiah to lead an army, but he sent them a baby. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, we get a picture of what some call the Christmas story. Starting at verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planning to send her away secretly, but when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his dream and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, 
but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and she called his name Jesus. You know, we thought we needed this first condo, you know, Marilyn and I and everything, and we put all of our work and all of our effort into it. But God knew we needed something else. The Jews. You know, these people in Jesus' day, they were putting all sorts of the same effort and work into what they thought they needed to do to get to heaven. Keeping the law. You know, waiting for the Messiah to come in and conquer. I mean, they were, they were focusing on all this and they were putting all their efforts into this. Just waiting for the Roman Empire to be defeated. <laughs> but God in His immaculate wisdom and His perfect wisdom and His, His excellent wisdom, He knew that they needed actually a different enemy to be defeated first. There was a greater enemy to their souls than the Roman Empire. It was their sin. Verse 21, you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. You know, we have so many things out there about the Christmas story and everything, but the bottom line reason for Christmas is so Jesus could save men from their sins. So he could forgive you and I, man and woman alike, male and female, rich and poor, young and old, that he could save us by forgiving our sins. That is the Christmas gift. That is the Christmas story. That is what God knew that we needed even when we did not understand that we needed it. That is what God ordained. God's ways are so different than our ways. We think we need a condo and he says, nope. This is a better one. We think we need a Messiah who's going to conquer. And he says, nope, you need a Messiah who is going to save and forgive. Brothers and sisters, as we run full tw tilt towards December 25th, let us slow down a bit. Let us sit and contemplate that Christmas is truly about what God has done. Not what we can do through our own strengths and our own efforts. It's about us being given a gift that is beyond comprehension. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever would believe upon Him shall not perish but have life eternal. I mean, that is the tremendous thing about Christmas. When we thought we needed one thing, which is maybe to be made more perfect or a little bit more willing or a little harder work, He says, no, I in my perfect wisdom, no, you just need grace and forgiveness. And I'm going to give you that. I'm going to dwell amongst you. Emmanuel, God with us. And he's still with us today, folks. Please remember that December 25th, as we wrap up the ser sermon, please remember that December 25th is not about ribbons and bows. It is not about packages and mistletoe. It is not about family and food. And it is not about a man who sneaks about into the homes of people dressed in red. That's a scary thought, folks. We pay good money to keep people out and he's getting in. And he's not like dressed in black or something that he can hide in the shadows. He's red and white. Christmas is about God ordaining the steps of men towards salvation. It is about God giving men the gift of forgiveness that he knew they needed even when they did not even see that they needed it. When we look upon the nativity scenes, there's one over there. When we look upon those scenes this week, Let's not say, oh, how cute. Do not see, when you look upon these nativity scenes, a little chubby-cheeked baby laying in a manger. But see, instead, God's perfect sacrifice that was born to die for our sins. 
Maybe that's why he was born in a, a dirty manger with smelly animals. Because that's how our sins are to God. He was born to die for us. That those sins that are a stench to God, that are filthy in his eyes, might be forgiven. There is real deep beauty in the manger. It's not cuteness, it's beauty. It's amazing. The sacrifice that lies there in that crib. I do not know what the next month holds for Marilyn and I. I mean, we're supposed to close now on February 7th and get the keys. Will it happen? I haven't a clue. But it's okay with me because God knows. I have total peace on what God does. Because I know God is ordaining our steps and if He gave me salvation through the sacrifice of His own Son, what more do I need? This week, this Christmas, I can rest assured. I can rest assured in the fact that God knows, that God ordains, that God delivers that which is good even when I do not know it is good. This week, as you look to the manger, be assured yourself that God knows and God cares. And God loves you so much that He would sacrifice His own Son. God knows what is best for us when we haven't a clue. So much so that even before any of us were born, He became a man. He dwelt with men. And He became the sacrifice for men and for their salvation. God offered Himself. He offered the sacrifice that through Jesus Christ brings forgiveness of sins to all who believe. And he did it just out of love. I mean, this year we're all, t- I mean, at Christmas time, so many of us are told to believe, you know. Well, what are we told to believe? Well, the Bible would have us believe in Jesus. And let us believe upon Jesus this week in the midst of all the Christmas chaos. Know that. He is the one who loves us and cares for us enough to die in our place and that He is still in control. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your your wisdom. We thank You for Your glory. We thank You that you, You became man. That You, in the incarnation, took on the flesh of man. That You might represent both God and man in the courtroom of, of justice, and that you yourself would become the justifier of we who are in this room, who have repented of our sins and placed our faith in you. We are just so thankful for that. Lord, in the coming days, as we, as we scurry about and, and do everything concerning last-minute plans for Christmas, let us not lose sight of the preciousness of this gift, of that sacrifice that lays in that manger. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.